Okay. Hi, everybody online. We already prayed. Go ahead and do it. Oh, we 
see the Lord seated on the throne, exalted, the train of his robe fills the temple with glory, and the whole earth is here, and the whole earth is here, and the whole Oh 
humble thyself in the sight of the Lord.
your face Pass me by the crowds of peoples And the priests who say their prayers I hunger and thirst for your righteousness Good evening, everybody. Lord, we thank you that we can be in your house. We thank you that we can worship publicly and um, without consequence. And we know there's other believers in the world that get persecuted for coming together. We just thank you that we still have that freedom here. We thank you for your covering, for your um, provision, for everything you provide for us, that we can just be in this place and that we can feel your presence. 
And I just ask that what you want to um, convey through this word, that it comes out through me the way that you gave it to me. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. It's good to see everybody. Um, we're going to continue on in Isaiah. Um, we have looked into the telescope in Isaiah all the way to the future. We have seen the glorious future of Jerusalem as a world center of peace and justice. The nations being disarmed and producing food and living together without aggression. We saw some of that in chapter 2. Um, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills. And the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall decide disputes for many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Um, then we put our telescopes down and we picked up our microscopes and we saw some of the tough stuff that was going on during Isaiah's own life. And as I've tried to hint, we're almost seeing a picture of the nations of the world today also. It's almost like Isaiah is speaking to his time, our time, and the future all at once. Yeah. Um, so let's turn our eyes back to the future. The prophecy... Uh, here as it began with hope, comfort, and encouragement, with the divine answer to the wrongs of man, the contrast to human pride and glory is divine pride and glory, and divine glory. There is nothing wrong with pride and glory, provided it is in the right things, and it is not to be in ourselves. It is to be in the branch of the Lord. We saw in chapter 4 that the branch of the Lord was introduced and uh, I believe it's the first time up into that point where it was talked about. Um, and we know that that's Jesus. Amen. Some people don't really know that. They haven't grasped it, but it's right there. When we read, when we read through, um, when we read through the rest of Isaiah, or, and then also in your own time, when you guys get to Jeremiah, or you've already seen this, we'll find the phrase, the branch of the Lord, again and again. It could be the branch of the Lord, or it could be the shoot of the Lord, or the sprout of the Lord, the new branch of Jehovah, many ways that the same uh, thing comes together. We come to the wonderful discovery that the branch of the Lord is to be the Christ, the Savior, the Messiah. This was one of his titles. We find it used right through the prophets and into the New Testament. The branch the shoot is to come out of God. He is to be the pride and the glory of Israel. We are not to be proud of our own dress, our own achievements, our own money, our own military might. Our pride and glory must be in the beautiful and glorious branch of Jehovah. This is the first mention of the prophets. This is, uh, I'm sorry, I'm nervous. Okay. Um, when he comes, this branch of God, about whom I will say much more later as we continue our study of Isaiah, he will bring two things. First, he will bring individual purity. The survivors of Israel and Jerusalem shall each be called holy, and those, shall survive, and those who survive shall um, have their names written in the book of life. Here we have a picture of individuals made holy. This is part of the future Isaiah, Isaiah sees. Not only that, but he sees a return to the days of the wilderness when God protected his people. Not that he doesn't, but when, his, when in the wilderness when they left Egypt, they really didn't have anything at all. And um, God protected them day in, day in, day out, at night. He had a covering over them. Um, and he sees above Jerusalem and Judah a pavilion or a wedding canopy, a covering. He sees a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of flaming fire by night. This is back to the wilderness where God watched over his people. They had no money in the wilderness, no army, no chariots. 
No idols except for that one regrettable lapse of judgment with the golden calf. But they had God. They had a pillar of fire and Isaiah sees that returning. He sees God's protection as in the days of the wilderness once again over his people as it is not in the day, as it is not, okay, so yeah, in the days of Isaiah that wasn't really happening. When the Assyrians came out and they took, they conquered the uh, northern land, there was no pillar of fire by day. So we know that like everything that happened during that time, it's not what he's talking about. Um, when the Chaldeans came, when one army after another came, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, um, basically the reason why this happened, and we learned this earlier, is because the people, uh, they turned their eyes away from God, and they focused on themselves, and they were just in a plethora of sin, and what God tends to do is He just releases His covering over our lives, and sometimes the enemies can come in. And it can be, in their time it was pretty bad, but in our time it can be a different type of enemy that comes in. When we sin in our own lives, we let different entities in that can mess our lives up just as bad. Um, but Isaiah sees in the future the people of God under the shade of God, shade from the sun in a shelter from the rain and storm. It is a picture, it is a picture, but a picture of protection. God looking after his people. Not, so not only is there international peace with the nations coming to the God of Jacob for their judgment, there is a wonderful picture of individual purity and God's protection as in the days of the wilderness. So we kind of looked through three different sections up till now. Two are about the future. They're a little hazy, but we can see the main outlines. We can see the details of the present much more clearly through the microscope. Most things predicted in the middle of section of Isaiah from chapter 2, verse 5 to chapter 4, verse 1 about the men, the children, and the women came true historically. We can read the secular records, we can read the records in the books of Kings and Chronicles on those grounds. I dare to believe that the first and the third sections will equally come. When God says He will do a thing, He does it. Sometimes it may take longer than we like, but He does it. In the fullness of time, God sent His Son, born of a virgin. Think how many centuries God took to prepare. How long He waited. 400 years after the last prophecy of Micah, He waited before sending Jesus. But He said He would send Him, and He did it. It may be a long time yet, or it may be a short time until we see Him again. Chapter 5 and chapter 6, which we're not going to get into tonight, is some of the best known um, chapters of Isaiah in the first half. We begin with chapter 5. It's a song about a vineyard, a song about God. Um, it seems as if by this time the people were getting sick of Isaiah's preaching and he had a job to make them listen. So he tried an unusual way of presenting the message of God. The strange thing is that sometimes people who do not like listening to sermons will listen to a song. Mm -hmm. Notice that it was a love song Isaiah gave the people. No doubt they gathered to listen. This was something new, a prophet singing a love song. Would someone read Isaiah chapter 5, verse 1 through 4, please? Now let me sing to my well-beloved the song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved as a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out the stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in the midst and also made a wine press in it. So he had expected to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, please, between me and my vineyard, what more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth good grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? Amen. So, Isaiah recites a song about his beloved God and his vineyard, Israel. It is no coincidence that the figurative use of the branch in the previous chapter 
matches perfectly with the analogy of the vineyard in this text. In fact, the branch will come forth from the same vineyard being born, both being born from of it and the root that supports it. And then, so my mind instantly went to Jesus telling the story of the, um, of the parable of the tenants. Um, so anyway, we'll go back to that. I don't want to get ahead. So um, the song employs the couplets and rhythms of Hebrew poetry, emphasizing the profound anguish of God over his people and their choice to break relationships with him. So where Pastor Perry just read, he was talking to them in the third person. And then in verse 5, it switches to the first person. And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. So he asked them what he should do. Is there anything more? How should we, like who to, who's to blame kind of thing? Um, and then the people probably gave their answers. It doesn't record that, but they probably said it's the person caring for it or it's the grapes. Um, and now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste and it shall not be pruned or hoed. And briars and thorns shall grow up. Um, the use of the vineyard as an allegory or living parable concerning the people of Israel is a strong theme of Isaiah. The vineyard is seen throughout Scripture as a symbol of provision, abundance, sweetness, and celebration. This is where I kind of took a turn more focusing just on the vineyard thing. Um, <clears throat> as soon as Noah left the ark, the first thing that he did was go and plant a vineyard. And the Old Testament gives us numerous instructions regarding the conduct of those who own vineyards, how much they can give to the poor, and there's so much uh, about it. So I started looking into the vineyard part of it, and um, there's a ton that I learned from that. Basically, they didn't really have an abundance of fresh water, so they put their kind of I don't know if you'd call it bacteria water in with the alcohol and it actually helped um, clean it kind of. Um, and so if we're the vineyard, if the Israelites are the vineyard or where the God's people were the vineyard, and God, so he's basically, when you have a vineyard, you have to, there's a ton of time that takes to prune everything, to plant everything the right way. There's so much involved. It's not like planting corn where you just plant some seeds and it comes up. So they're like the person... It just start, took my mind down this kind of rabbit hole over the vineyard thing. I hope I can try to explain what I was trying to get to. But um, So the people were...